Welcome to the World Space Week podcast for 2011. I'm Elf. And I'm Haritina Mogoshanu, Manager of Educational Relations for World Space Week Association. To celebrate World Space Week 2011, we've put together a series of podcasts to enthrall and excite you with the most interesting and inspiring space stories from across the globe. And today we are featuring... Julien Girard, astronomer at the European Southern Observatory, an international organization with 15 member states that found a tremendous uh, facility uh, based uh, in Chile. And uh, we operate the biggest telescopes in the world. And we are the frontier of the, the research in astronomy and astrophysics. So I, I started to work at ESO a little bit more than two years ago. And I'm based in San Santiago, Chile, and I often go to one of the sites of ESO, which is called Paranal Observatory in the Atacama Desert in the northern part of Chile. And it's where the, the sky is very pure and uh, we have uh, very big optical telescopes operated uh, 365 days a year. And uh, I'm responsible of one of the instruments. Uh, my uh, specialty is uh, adaptive optics, the technique to uh, get rid of the atmospheric effect on the images of the telescope in order to have uh, nearly the, the same quality as a space telescope, but from the ground. Most of the time I, uh, I have duties, let's say, that uh, my job is composed of two parts. One part is service for the community. I observe four people located in different places in the world, like everywhere. I observe with them if they come. Eventually they sometimes come to the observatory to uh, to use uh, the equipment in a specific way and we help them uh, like that. We support their observations. And uh, 20% of my time is actually de dedicated to my uh, personal research, my free research, let's say. And it's uh, difficult to find those 20% of the time, but uh, with passion, we actually find them uh, even outside of the, the workspace. So adaptive optics, this is a technique that was developed in the 80s, mainly by the army in the US, and it was classified. It was uh, something they, they used mainly to look towards the Earth and not so much to, uh, to the stars. The astronomers in the uh, late 80s, uh, beginning of the 90s, they developed this technique to get rid of the, the turbulence uh, effect on the, on the images. So basically the, the light when it goes through the, the, the atmospheric uh, turbulent uh, layers of the, the atmosphere, of the Earth's atmosphere, yeah, the light is deflected. And so we observe uh, images that are not as sharp as we expect with the diffraction theory of the telescope. Let's say instead of getting a very nice diffraction pattern from a telescope, a point-like star, we get uh, some kind of freckles that are moving around, uh, some uh, disturbance, let's say, and it's very fast. And it depends on the wind and different things like that. So adaptive optics, we use a bright star close to what we observe. We measure those uh, deflections with different techniques, with front centers. And then we use a deformable mirror that will correct in real time those deflections to get back to uh, an almost perfect uh, image. What adaptive optics does is it would stop stars from twinkling. Is that right? Yeah, well, the twinkling is actually some kind of secondary effect. But basically, yes, when you're in a good site, the stars twinkle less. When you're in a bad site, close to a city with humid atmosphere, and the stars twinkle a lot. So adaptive optics, yes, will remove the twinkling. Other effects that an eye cannot see, so only big telescopes can see, let's say. You mentioned that... Um Adaptive optics was first invented for military. The telescope itself was first used for military purposes. They um, used the telescope to spot the enemy troops. Yeah, this is true. Well, I, I don't know, actually. Uh, I mean, astronomers uh, in ancient times, they, they, may, they may not have telescopes, but an eye is just a small telescope with five millimeter aperture, you know. I mean, the first telescopes, uh, the Galilean telescope and the things like that, yeah, they were used to spot the enemy, but they were also used to describe what what, they, what was seen in, uh, in space. I think I think it's always the, the same thing, you know. A lot of times the inventions are not exactly uh, from who we, the, the large public think they are. And uh, a lot of times the, the smart guy is the guy that really makes the invention popular. So of course, Galileo got all the light 
And uh, Hans, the Dutch guy, he was probably uh, fooled by uh, the military. Oh, I don't know, but uh, you see, you see the same thing in software, in Facebook, in everything. You know. <laughs> How is tomorrow going to look like? What do you see um, happening in the future? On a small human scale, tomorrow is going to be exactly the same as today. Let's say, but uh, <laughs> except of the weather, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> In cosmological scale, uh, I mean, stars are dying, other stars are uh, in process of birth. You will, you have an expansion on a, of the universe. You have um, a lot of different mechanisms going on. And uh, on the scale of the Earth, of course, I mean, as an astronomer, we get uh, we we are very sensitive to climate change and uh, how the the earth is badly handled by the humankind uh, even though we we like okay there are so many stars and so many potential worlds we feel very concerned about this special world that is our, our own and that's in uh, bad shape let's say in bad uh, trajectory so how tomorrow is going to look like well It's difficult not to be pessimistic and at the same time nice things are happening as well. The astronomer has his human side and his uh, cold abstract side. So which one <laughs> which one is supposed to answer the question? <laughs> so I guess I don't I don't know. <laughs> But that's a great answer. <laughs> well, assuming we don't kill ourselves off over the next thousand years for example, what kind of things might we see out there in the night sky? In 1,000 years, if we're still here, I guess we will probably discover new things. I mean, that's for sure. We might uh, solve a few questions that we have now. We might find new questions. We might discover uh, planets like Earth orbiting uh, different stars in the solar neighborhood. We might have a clue on different universes, I don't know, or different theories and what was before the Big Bang, maybe. And we'll probably know more about how the solar system formed. There is this limit of reionization at very high uh, redshift, where that's where we see the oldest in the, in the universe right now, or the youngest, if you take the time base from the Big Bang. So we, we might go beyond that. So we might see basically uh, the first galaxies ever formed, the kind of plasma that was formed after So the Big Bang. So basically, I think that's what I can imagine now. But uh, in 1,000 years, is really a lot. 1,000 years, we, we might just have blown ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> or, or gone to Mars. <laughs> or gone to Mars. I mean, right now, it's kind of not really uh, pushed, I feel. But in 1,000 years, everything is possible, I guess. That's great. So you mentioned that we might be discovering other planets like Earth orbiting other stars. How many exoplanets, how many planets outside of our solar system have we actually discovered at the moment? And are they very interesting? So far, there are about 1,000 exoplanets discovered. Officially, there is uh, actually a website, exoplanet.eu. Today, it says 684. But that's because a lot of them are, are not confirmed or they are not published yet. They are not. Uh, so let's say about 1,000. It's, uh, it's going fast. It's about 1,000 in, uh, in 15 years, basically. Wow. So um, so now we have different kinds of exoplanets detected, let's say, and a lot of them are very different from Earth because a lot of them are detected indirectly. One technique is called transit technique, so it's like these uh, satellites called uh, Kepler. They look at a star and they see a tiny uh, drop in intensity and then it goes back up. And it means that something passed in front of the star. So they have different ways of getting rid of artifacts. And uh, when it's confirmed, they, they can estimate how deep is this transit and uh, the characteristic of this planet, what the period is. And most of these planets are, are, are very fast orbiting planets. They're very close to the to their star. So a lot of them are hot Jupiter and they orbit in a few hours, sometimes a few days, but they are really, really fast. They, have, they are nothing like we have in the solar system. And it's very interesting, but it's not quite what we expected, let's say. The interesting thing is that with the transit technique, you can go down to super Earth. They actually found already a few planets that are a few masses of Earth, let's say. And uh, some of them, some of the systems have more than one planet. The system like the one they just put published a few days ago, is it's actually one planet orbiting two different stars because there are a lot of binary stars in space in, uh, in the universe. 